Thank you, Vic. And thanks for the invitation. And uh, it's actually my pleasure to be here. Um, I'm having a sabbatical in Australia and a very nice time thinking of, uh, about how we can move on with trading. And actually, this is one of the other centers which is really important in that respect. So I'm really glad to be here. All right. So my basic point is now to tell you about where we are in the field of cognitive training in general in relation to addictions. Uh, this is my uh, setup. I'll talk first of all about cognitive biases. What are they and why should we want to change them? Then on cognitive training and then I'll do a little comparison with medication to see how the effects, yeah, how strong are they compared to medication in addiction and then some talk about next steps. And of course, there's where the real interesting struggles also are. All right, <coughs> so cognitive biases. We talk about a biased pattern of information processing. And over the years, we've distinguished three broad categories, attention, memory, and action tendencies. And within attention, there's actually sub-processes. So you can have a biased engagement, but also a disengagement. And actually, the disengagement seems to be the most important one in addiction. Uh, memory associations, um, which can be related to antecedents. So Friday night, feeling good. I'm sure some of you will have some associations. Um, but also to effects. And then there's action tendencies. I was actually originally trained by Nico Freida, famous now late emotion psychologist from uh, the Netherlands and he his model is about appraisal leading directly to action tendency so that's also why uh, when I came to the field and um, I saw there was a lot on attention which is more related to the appraisal side of things I saw, thought maybe there's also something going on in the action tendencies as you will see and I'm sure many of you are aware because that's actually where we get training effects as well of course, this is not the whole story in addiction. There's a whole neurocognitive profile. Um, there's good evidence that addictions are associated with relatively weak executive control functions. And that is a whole umbrella term with planning, working memory, inhibition, etc. Um, there's much debate to what extent these functions, like suboptimal functions, are more of a precursor of addiction or more of a consequence or some combination. Uh, we did a review 2014 uh, arguing that it's actually uh, stronger evidence for the precursor. But of course this is a moving field and it might be even different for different functions. So. Um, there's other stuff going on. For example, uh, the collaborators at UNSW, one of them, Lucy Alberta, now moved to Monash, um, have this interesting paradigm where you look at basically attentional bias or attentional capture, but then for stimuli that are learned within the session. And in their interesting paradigm, on every trial that you actually, your attention is captured by those stimuli, you lose all, you, you can't win anything. Still, you see an effect. And what we found in the first uh, study together, what is actually when you moderate this very neutral capture of attention by reward stimuli by the executive control is that it's related to how much illegal drugs students use. So it's the very first step, but it could actually be a more general mechanism that we want to go into. And on Monday I'll talk a little bit further with some follow-up studies there. Um, there's also another, and of course we can go on with this list, but other interesting stuff going on like suboptimal self-insight. And that is a difficult one in treatment. I'm sure I'm uh, preaching to the choir now, but... Uh, and with Antonio, it's interesting, it has an interest in self-insight also and the neurocorrelates, insula, very important, but there might be different aspects to this uh, self-insight. So that brings you also to the question, could you also specifically target these functions and would that have an effect in addiction? So, how do we interpret these differences? Um, we proposed a dual process model for addictions uh, over 10 years ago now. It's still 
cited widely, but the bad part is we ourselves step mostly away from it. So it's a, a slightly embarrassing at moments. Sometimes this happens. You have this like ongoing insights that there are some issues, especially from a neuroscience perspective with the, say the simple dual process models because you can't really separate the so-called different systems. Um, so we have moved to more continuous alternatives really. Um, there's also an alternative psychological approach which emphasizes that people have different goals and then cues just basically activate different goals within the same overall system. I'll give you an example in a second. Our latest model is a uni model with meta control as a moderator which uh, came out last December in Trends in Cognitive Science. So let's get this more concrete. I'm sure you've seen enough of the addiction stuff, but let's make this more relevant for all of us. So let's say um, you had a nice meal and then also at some point you decided that you don't want to gain more weight, as uh, many people do in the Western world, which is a good thing. So you have a diet goal, but at that moment when you have clearly had enough calories after a nice meal, the uh, dessert trolley comes, so what you're going to do. So from multiple goals perspective, the idea is that people obviously have multiple goals, so you come in with this diet goal, but you also have another goal, for example, to enjoy life, to enjoy dinners, the company, etc. And of course, these stimuli will activate this goal. And um, we know from general goal theory that when you have two competing goals, that if you activate one, the other one automatically is reduced. So we don't need like qualitatively different systems for the conflict in such a situation. And it might be relatively close to what people with addictions <coughs> are going through. All right, so cognitive biases, neurocognitive profile, clearly it exists. There are differences with people who suffer from addictions with other people. However, you should also keep in mind that they're relative. Uh, for example, this approach bias I'll show in a bit and also how we train it. We find it on average for people who smoke, who smoke cannabis, who uh, use lots of alcohol. Uh, recent study also for <coughs> gambling materials, so it's a very general thing in addictive behaviors, but you don't find it in everyone, and not even, and clearly not on every trial. It's really an average thing. So if you do many trials, you see this <coughs> overall tendency to approach something, which might be relevant. But it's not a absolute thing, and sometimes it's presented like, you know, these people can't resist the approach tendency, that's, I think, not really what we typically see. I, I mean, in specific consequence, of course, it could be close to a relapse, but that's really a very uh, strong case. So then a general interesting question, I would argue, is to what extent can all of these differences, basically, be remediated just by abstinence? That's the first question. So I would definitely argue that if you assess some of these biases, but also other neuropsychological functions, repeat it. See what already changes with abstinence. It's very important. Because that's your, you know, ba part of the baseline yet. And then the next question is, can some of these functions be specifically improved when you start training? Um, I do have a little footnote here, and that is like the prototypical situation would be, say, working memory is lower in the average patient you see here than uh, the average in the population. So if with abstinent or even after specific training you get an improvement but not quite to the population mean, then people will generally interpret this as uh, partial re remediation. Of course you don't know because it could have been one of those etiological factors and this could just be the max. All right, uh, just as a brief aside, there's also this discussion going on to what extent addiction is a brain disease. The standard model, um, 
made famous by the former NIDA president Leschner. Addiction is a chronic relapsing brain disease. And it's basically a kind of neural variety of AA. So the idea is no matter what you do, you always have this vulnerability. Um, however, this has been questioned because actually a lot of people, most people, if you look at the epidemiological data, who suffer at some point in their life of an addiction quit, even without professional help. And even severe addicts can inhibit a tendency to go for a drug reward if, if they want to, basically. Not always, but um, if you're interested in the, this, also look at the research of Carl Hart. And recently, there was this paper, it's online now, in addiction research and therapy, uh, theory, art, where a uh, European launch of an addiction theory network where the brain disease model of addiction was questioned and basically different authors have different positions. So my position is very simple. It's often presented as the truth, but it's not, it's a hypothesis. So if a specific function is say a brain disease in addiction, then what you have to show is that it decreases over time. So first of all, you need of course pre-measures. Second, that it doesn't recover after abstinence and maybe not even after training. And third, that this actually plays a role in the relapse. None of this has been sufficiently done to call at this moment addiction a brain disease, which doesn't mean that it doesn't affect the brain. But as you will see, much of this can actually uh, improve. Uh, it's also related to the question of free will and together with my neighbor who studies philosophy in uh, UCL, we did a paper on free will and addiction in the journal you read every week, Neuroethics. Anyway, <coughs> so now to cognitive training. Um, I did this recent commentary to a paper by uh, the group from Warren Bickle, who does a lot of working memory training. Um, and this was something I often drew on the board for students, but I th thought I actually never put this in a paper, so I thought it might actually be handy for people talking about training. So it's like a general taxonomy. Um, I think the main differentiating factor when you look at different types of training is whether you put disorder relevant stimuli in yes or no. So on the one hand, you have the general ability training, eh, working memory training, uh, but also inhibition training, self-control training, uh, mindfulness you could put in there, maybe exercise. There's nothing related to the actual drug cues. That's the one denominator. Um, and then you have all sorts of varieties of training where you target a cognitive bias and then of course you need those specific cues that elicit the bias. So it's a simple way to differentiate between the two. So general ability training, it can be done. Um, there's some positive effects I'll show you, I'll briefly mention you. But the general issue here is generalization. And um, it's very long, it takes a lot of effort. So probably especially good for longer inpatient programs. Cognitive bias modification, um, I'll talk about next. So general training abilities, a lot of the working memory training has been done in childhood psychopathology, especially ADHD. Uh, Torko Klimberg from Sweden did a lot of those studies and claims that it works. Um, however, if you look at generalization, people have become rather sceptical over the years these days. Um, we did a study to see if it works in addiction. You get this type of patterns and your task as a participant is basically to repeat the patterns. As you see, there's no picture of alcohol or anything involved. So you get this type of patterns and your job is to repeat the pattern. Very simple. And then you have two groups. So one group you follow and they get better over time. And the other group, they're at three and they're always having success. So if a success experience would be the driving factor, this group would actually do the best. However, this group is better trained to higher levels, as you see, and this actually is also 
holds up at follow-up. So we can train working memory, it takes a lot of time. So you have to have a motivation to do something. Uh, 25 sessions this was, but it has some effects. The question is, does it change the drinking? These were like problem drinkers over the web. And the answer is, it depends. So <coughs> in the subgroup who had strong automatic associations with positive associations with alcohol, it actually worked. So those people had a kind of a automatically triggered tendency to go for alcohol. They get better control if they're in the training group. You see some overall effect, not very strong, but once you put this moderator in, it's actually significant. Um, so I mentioned him already, Warren Bickle does a lot of this work, found reduced delay discounting in stimulant addiction. Small study, but it's interesting finding. And there's this recent paper in alcohol dependent patients, but it also found effects on future episodic thinking. And that is, can you kind of see yourself in a future situation, visualize that, and of course that is relevant in a therapeutic co context as well. So that could be uh, actually something which is helpful for the therapeutic process. What he also found was rate dependent change, so that means that specifically those patients with low working memory profit from working memory training. So here your neuropsych assessment, if you include working memory, can actually uh, put people to the right additional training. And as Marsha Bates, it's an interesting paper, has shown when people get better on a function like that, and so the feedback is very important, that's actually motivating, of course, in the process of change. So now we go to the other branch, cognitive bias modification, and I'll dwell a little bit on how it originated, because that's actually important in appreciating how the effects are, um, if we look at them in all the studies so far. So as I've introduced, cognitive biases are related to psychopathology and health problems. Um, they are both cross-sexually and prospectively. So over the 1980s and 90s, when we did our PhD, there were tons of studies showing a correlation between some attentional bias and say anxiety or depression or heroin use, as uh, we both did in our early years. Um, but of course you never know, is there any causal relationship there? It could just be a byproduct or something, yeah, it's correlational. So in general, if you want to show that some factor has a causal role, there's only one real good method to do that, and that's an experiment. So what you want to do then is target that bias, change it, and see does it have some short-lived effect on behavior. So Colin McLeod over in Perth, where I stayed my first month here, uh, did the very first test of CBM. So he selected medium anxiety students, assessed their threat bias, and then half of them were trained toward threat cues and the other half away from threat cues. And just to see, does that have an effect on the bias, but also on related behaviors? So he had a second experiment where they were stressed with solving insolvable anagrams, and the people who were trained toward threat got way more stressed than the people who were trained away from threat. So crucially, what this shows is that there is a causal effect of that bias on the behavior in this case it's stress, but it's not a therapy. Obviously you don't want to make people more stressed, so you would never train them toward threatening cues. And the same of course with alcohol or mm -hmm. with other addictions. So then we moved this idea to alcohol, as did other people, and so you take one of those tests of attentional bias, for example the dot probe, so you have two pictures and the participant indicates where <coughs> No, what do you see? Two or one dots. And then overall, if you like drinking a lot, you've got to be a little bit faster when the dots replace alcohol than non-alcohol. It's probably the worst test you can choose for attentional bias in terms of reliability. Very close to zero. It's really bad. So one of the focuses in the lab on the other side is get more reliable measures. And eye movements do a better job. But there's also new varieties of the test that much, are much better. 
However, the nice thing is, without telling anyone, you can just simply start by having half of the dots behind the alcohol and half after the non-alcohol, but then change to either all of the dots behind the alcohol, uh, that's what the alcohol industry wants to do, of course, <coughs> and focus the attention toward alcohol. If you do the same design with just not problematically drinking students, you can see, does it actually increase their craving and their drinking? Um, and the other, more interesting from a clinical perspective group, will be trained away from alcohol. So these are students who come in, you know, for uh, getting course credit and uh, tasting beer or something like that. And then, in this case, we had pretty heavy drinkers. So after uh, discussions with the ethical committee, we decided to keep a 50-50 control group and not train them further to alcohol. They were already very good in drinking. Um, and then there's the, um, the group that's trained away from alcohol. So what are the effects? This is the attentional bias. And then what you see is that um, after training, it changes to negative, which means they now have a bias toward the non-alcohol drinks. So that's promising. However, you also see the light blue and dark blue bars. And the light blue ones were the pictures that were used during the training. So this is a, just a very simple training effect. It's just what they've been doing. But of course, the interesting thing is this one, untrained pictures. And even further generalization, another task, drinking, etc. So what, what do you find? You find it on the trained pictures, but this, this effect is not significant. As you see, it does go in the right direction. So what we argued was we need just a higher dose. Yeah, if it was a medication study, you would just improve your dose or whatever. Here, this means more sessions with novel stimuli every time. Um, so that's basically, uh, this is just an exemplary study of those early single session studies. You can change the bias, but really not strong evidence for generalization. So then the question is, if you do multiple sessions, what do you get then? And then we move to uh, our first clinical sample. This was in several institutions in the Netherlands. Poor PhD student, uh, now assistant professor also at UVA. Uh, Tim Schoenmakers took him more than two years to get 43 patients. Um, and half of them were randomized to a group that's trained away from alcohol. The other group does a control task. I'll show you later how this task looked, but showing the exact same pictures, but categorizing them with something irrelevant, odd and even numbers. But the nice thing of this control task is that everyone sees the same pictures, so it can't just be Q exposure. And the nice thing is you gave the same motivating feedback. You're getting better, etc. And it's true, everyone always gets better if you do a lot of these tasks. So what do we find? After five sessions, we get the interaction effect. And now also for untrained pictures, you see a negative attentional bias after the training. So that's good. And what you also see is that if you don't train, but still see the same pictures, on average, there's actually an increase in the attentional bias. And of course, here it's a small sample, so this was kind of, is this a real thing? But other people have found it as well. And in a very recent, very big study, I'll show you in the end, um, that same effect was also found in the control group. So it seems that the default, this is kind of worrying, if you're treating somebody and you talk about, you know, how bad alcohol is, etc., that probably through incubation physiological processes, meanwhile, the attentional bias goes up which is bad news once you're back out in the world where on every corner you'll see VB or something like that. Heineken in our case. And uh, Miles Cox has already shown this to the extent that this bias increases actually predicts relapse. So that's why it's important to train this away. And here it was also that this group shows actually later relapse than this group. So there's some promise here although of course it's the first small study. But I'm pretty confident now, given the last study that I'll show you with real big numbers. Um, also note from like a more mechanism 
that this is really the 500 milliseconds where you find all the effects. You don't find anything at a very fast engagement attentional bias. So it's really the kind of disengagement where you have attentional capture by a relevant stimulus for a person, in the case alcohol, but also some desire to not look at the alcohol. This interplay, this is where training apparently does its job. Okay, so then we move on to action tendencies. Same logic, I'll first show you how we assess it and then how we change it, and whether that has effects. Uh, you're probably familiar with this idea. We used the, um, in the first studies, landscape portrait as irrelevant feature. So we first train people with gray rectangles to push and pull depending on uh, the type of picture. And then there's the zoom effect. <coughs> if you pull the picture, or the joystick towards you, the picture gets big. And that's important because then we're all on the same page that this is approach. Otherwise, I might think, hey, this is approach. One out of five people has the other interpretation otherwise. So this is avoid. Assessment, heavy drinking students on average have an ever approach bias for alcohol. And we found it to be moderated by a gene, the OPOM1 gene, which is also related to Q-induced craving. Um, we also had general positive pictures in, general negative. You don't find this bias. If you use an irrelevant feature version like this task, you typically don't find a bias. You do find it when you ask people to pull positive and push negative, that's easier than the other way around. But when they react to something irrelevant, you typically don't find such a difference. However, with this highly uh, motivationally relevant stimuli for a heavy drinker, you do find it. So that suggests it's really quite a strong thing and interesting to see if we can change it. So again, the general logic is we find this bias. <coughs> then the first question is, can we change it in students? Proof of principle study. So here we use this like split design uh, had the hazardous drinking students, but not the problem drinkers. So audits between eight and 12. They all start pushing and pulling equally often, but then by randomization, it's determined whether after some point you'll push most of the alcohol pictures or you'll pull. And what we found is actually a strong effect because we found already generalization to untrained pictures in a single session, which we never found for attentional retraining and even to a different task using words. I'll show you in a minute how that task looks. And to behavior in a taste test. And that is what they came for. So we have these posters with, do you taste the difference with three glasses of beer? And they're lining up behind my, or in front of my door. Okay, so that's promising results. And then we said, let's try this in the clinic. This was the <coughs> first study in a series of studies with uh, this group from Germany. Beautiful clinic, uh, about 100 kilometers outside Berlin, and um, real big numbers. So you'll see the numbers getting bigger and bigger, so which is, of course, very nice if you try to find not too big effects. Um, in this first study, we had two training groups. They did the exact same thing, four sessions of pushing alcohol pictures away. The one difference was that we told in one group, we told them to push alcohol, and in the other group, it was based on the format, so we never told them anything. Didn't make any difference in the results, so we just collapsed them. And then we have both a 50-50 assessment control group, so they see the same pictures, but no contingency is changed, and a group who does just pre- and post-test. So no training. Also, did, did, this didn't make any difference. This is the test I mentioned earlier. Also here we found this. So you train with these pictures. You find the effect on this task where you sort words. So here there can be the word beer, and then you press left, or there can be Coke, and you press right. But there can also be an approach words like this. You also press left, or an avoid word like away, and you press right. So here alcohol and approach words are under the same button, and here Soft drink and avoid are under the same button. And then we have this other sorting category where soft drink and approach is under the same button and now alcohol is with avoid. As you see, the blue bars, the pretest, no differences between the group. 
what you see is that on average, the alcohol-dependent patient is faster to sort alcohol with approach than with alcohol with avoid. Similar to the attentional bias, so you're talking, and these were pretty heavy alcohol-dependent patients. On average, 12 years of problems, several failed previous detoxifications, and often they're sent from all over Germany, basically because they're threatened also in their job, they might have other health problems. So, you know, it's not some light group, it's a pretty serious group. So if you talk with them, you know, they, as I'm sure many of you do, they'll tell you everything that's bad about alcohol, right? Meanwhile, there are automatic associations, on average, alcohol approach. Not handy, of course, if you're tired and you see a VB sign, something like that. If you don't train, it's not going to change. So, of course, these people do have other treatment. Eh? It's on top of regular treatment. Still, those specific biases are not changed. However, if you do train, you see that it actually collapses to the other side, to alcohol avoid as the dominant association. So that's nice. And then another nice thing in this particular clinic is that uh, as a standard routine, they always follow everyone up a year after treatment discharge. Actually, the insurance companies make them do that. So this is, of course, brilliant to do your research because you only do the study and later on you get just the data of a one-year follow-up. Heaven, from a research perspective. Um, and what was interesting, if you split the group, whether they had the training on top of their three-month stay, so it's really it's four sessions of 20 minutes, minutes of training or not, or control training, in a like overall regime of three months. So we really didn't expect here much. I think I would have put in like a three months otherwise, but yeah, you get this for free. So of course this is what you get, but 13% less relapse. So that was quite amazing and uh, promising. So then of course it's important, does this effect hold? And we had a replication study you see now over 500 people um, where we looked at several things. Also mediation and moderation, so these are statistical terms to look at the mechanism. We found 9% less relapse here, but the nice thing is that we actually showed that this clinical outcome is related to the change in the approach bias, it's mediation, statistical mediation. And also, and this actually is a bit like the effect in working memory training, but now reversed that primarily those people with a strong bias profit from this type of training, like the people with low working memory profit from working memory training. And as I'm sure you're all aware, it also works here, so that's nice. As Victoria and the whole team here uh, showed. So that's very cool. Uh, this was the first uh, like independent replication in another culture, so that's also very nice. Small study, but interestingly, actually a larger effect. So you guys were either just lucky or it's meaningful because the difference is that it was done during detoxification. And our first study, so we had 13% difference, was in the week when they came in, but in this clinic in Germany, they detox all over Germany and then come to the clinic. The second study, and also the next study I'll show you where we get eight and a half, nine percent, is later on in the treatment program. So there seems to be a trend that the earlier, the bigger effects, but of course you need a direct comparison to make this a real case. Um, I did not change name or gender along <laughs> the way, but I do have a cousin <laughs> who shares the gene for addiction research, <laughs> as we found out. Um, so I did not know of her existence, and at that time I was in Maastricht, and I get this email from a colleague from England that she had somebody with my name who wanted to do addiction research. <laughs> Dora Duca, you might know her. And I said, how can this be? So I checked with my dad, and he could actually figure out that it was a far cousin. So our grandfathers were brothers. Clearly, we have this gene. 
anyway, so she, we met in Amsterdam when she was back and I had moved there. And uh, she set out to do her PhD on imaging and addiction in the Berlin group, which is a very good group in this field. With Andreas Heinz and Hendrik Walter and Felix Bempel. And of course, Berlin is not too far from this clinic. So we set up this collaboration where she hired the van and the scanner, got a bunch of the alcohol de patient, dependent patients over, scanned them, then they got the training, and then with the van again to the imaging facility to have the post test. And what did we find? Um, Q reactivity, so in the scanner, the amygdala lights up um, significantly stronger for alcohol than other substances, and this decreases more strongly if you do real training compared to sham training. So we do have some idea of what it changes in the Q reactivity. And very ingeniously, she also put in a joystick in the scanner, and you need special joystick without metal, obviously. And um, she even found the approach bias in the scanner, which I would not have counted on, uh, but she did. And also that was related to medial prefrontal cortex activation. And that also specifically goes down with training compared with uh, sham training. So we understand uh, a little bit more about neural effects of CBM. And this is the fresh data. As you see, sample gets bigger and bigger. This did take a couple of years. But now we have a two by two study in press only a week. where we combined the two approaches you have seen. So the approach bias training, familiar, but also the attentional training, remember the dots. And then you get either six sessions of one, so approach bias training, or six sessions of attentional training, or a bit of both, three of each, or any of the corresponding placebo training varieties, or nothing. And here we look at the relapse, as you see, if you get training, doesn't matter which combination, you do better a year later again after either sham training or relapse or uh, nothing. And again, also here, there's no difference. So we had actually expected to be the both condition to be the best. Not, none of this is significant. It's all better than sham training and uh, placebo. But as you see, it's not a lower number. We have some idea why, and that is that in a different study we looked at the optimal learning curves with a lot of individual differences, but they varied from 2 to 12 sessions where people were still learning. So 3 sessions probably just too little for most people. So 6 seems to be a good average to do, but of course ideally you want to kind of level this to an individual. So that's actually one of the future steps. So again, 8.5% less relapse. This was also later on in the therapeutic process. So this is really the number kind of it stabilizes on if you do it later on during the therapeutic process. The bias changes specifically. So if you change approach bias, that one changes. If you change attentional bias, that one changes, but not the other, which also uh, is in line with some other research we did that they are related, but also have unique features. Uh, we didn't find the mediation that you found that you saw in the previous big study, and that's probably related to tons of measurement issues we had here. Uh, I already mentioned this. So this is where we are, and then the question is: Does CBM, this line of training, work in addiction? Well, probably like uh, me, after seeing these studies, we would argue that it does. Um, but there was a meta-analysis uh, two years ago which said the relationship between cognitive bias and addiction was not significant. And also the conclusion, our results cast serious doubt on clinical utility of CBM interventions for addiction. So how come? Well, that's because in this meta-analysis, apples and oranges are combined, as we argued in two direct commentaries in the PLOS One, but also we have this paper which will come out later this month. Um, what's in a trial? Because what's the point? 
this is why I also highlighted that earlier, they're really qualitatively different studies. The one is where you try to establish causality in students, they don't have a therapeutic goal. We don't have a therapeutic goal. We want to see if you make a little change in this bias, does it have a small lift effect in behavior? It's just an experimental question. It's not a therapeutic question. That's why you can also train them toward alcohol, which obviously you would never do in an intervention. They're not motivated to change. Why do they come? Course credit, money, beer. <laughs> the ideal study to participate, right? And if you look at those studies here, and then actually it's very similar to the situation in anxiety, what you get is if you succeed in changing this bias, you typically see a small lift effect. So something on craving or taste test, but nothing major, of course, because if you don't want to change your behavior, you know, science fiction to think that you do a single session of some training and suddenly you'll change all your behavior. Uh, then we have the clinical trials. The ones that you've seen are all here, where the efficacy is tested as an add-on to regular treatment. So, we talk about patients, not about students. They are aware they might receive an intervention, and they're motivated to change. So what do you find here? Oh, and they have the goal of abstinence. Typically, we force that upon them. Otherwise, we kick them out, right? I'm not sure how you do it here, but in many places, surely in the German clinic. So this is an undisputed goal, and it might be very relevant. Uh, here, what you see and have seen is consistent add-on effects. Depends a little bit on the study, but say eight to, in our hands, 13%, eight and a half to 13%. But maybe even better if you do it during detox. Then there's the third line where there is a clinical goal, but it's people who do something on the web. So here you get tons of dropout, and they are motivated, but for something else, and that is to reduce their drinking. And what you get is exactly what they want. They reduce their drinking. But it doesn't matter which condition they are, real training, sham training, doesn't make any difference. So in that group, it's probably something which non-specifically adds to their self-efficacy or something like that. Um, and this is only one published study of our group in 2015, but we and uh, Matt Field's group have very similar uh, results in uh, studies in the pipeline. So I'm actually pretty confident about this overall um, conclusion as well. As we argued in this uh, recent paper in Journal of Studies in Alcohol and Drugs, it's actually a symptom of a broader problem brought about by new NIH clinical trials policies. Because until recently, a clinical trial was what you would think it would be, a clinical trial with patients uh, wanting to change. But then they changed this policy and there was a lot of uproar among basic scientists and brain scientists also that now, according to their change definitions, every experiment is a clinical trial. And then you get exactly this confusion that I just showed that, you know, causality aimed basic study in students who don't want to change is the same thing as a clinical trial in patients, which I think we would probably agree that it's not. So there was a lot of uproar and protest. And last month, the Congress stopped NIH with this folly. So that's nice. Uh, it's not a paper if you're interested in this kind of more basic experimental medicine approach. So an RCT tests efficacy of a standard of something typically on top of standard treatment. Does it add, and that's the type of studies I've mostly shown you, and proof of principle studies in students are about can we change this bias in either direction? Does it have a direct effect? So it's really a different research question in a different phase of the experimental medicine <coughs> framework. So in conclusion, my conclusion at least would be that it does seem to work in alcohol use disorders when people are motivated to change. Um, and probably it works mostly in those people who have, they're motivated to change, but they're having problems because of strong cure activity, strong biases, strong impulsivity, as we showed in another study. It's not 
uh, effective in binge drinkers who are not motivated to change. So many people who heard my talk say, oh yeah, this is great because we have all these binge drinking students. We'll do a couple of sessions of training and then it's all over. Well, it's not. Doesn't mean you can't do it with students. There could be groups who are real heavy drinkers and want to change, who also, you know, are impulsive, etc. I mean, it's not the most likely of combinations, but uh, you shouldn't confuse the proof of principle studies with clinical studies, but of course you can also do clinical studies in students, as we actually also do. Um, and then the last thing is, can we improve training? But first I'll just sidestep a little bit to make an idea of where we are with medication in addiction medicine. And this is the last meta-analysis that I could find. We find number needed to treat of 12 for a camprosate for abstinence and also of 12 for naltrexone for reduced drinking. And if you convert the 8.5%, which is like the probably the most uh, conservative, but also the one on the largest trials number, which you reduce one year relapse with CBM, it's exactly the same thing. Number needed to treat 12. But it could be that the actual effects when you're closer to detox might be bigger. Uh, we also did this recent study on buclofen. This is a, was a big uh, demand from the patients after uh, this French cardiologist Amaisen cured himself with a high dose of buclofen. Um, and interestingly in France it was already temporarily uh, available on the market. So tons of French are on uh, high dose buclofen even before there was any clinical trial, which is quite remarkable. Um, the first clinical trial uh, was done in uh, Berlin again. Um, and here they had a very heavy drinking sample and it was no other treatment. They find a big effect. We had a larger study, no effect whatsoever, but it was added to regular treatment. So that is an interesting thing, I think that as I showed you, for CBM to have effect, you really need regular treatment. So it could, if you put the right form of CBM on top of regular treatment, you get better one-year outcomes, as we showed. Um, but we don't get it as a standalone. With this medication, at least, and there's some other work from the combined trial suggesting the same thing, it might be the exact opposite. So it might be something you want to do more with people who don't respond to regular psychosocial treatment, maybe added with CBM. It's, you know, this is just not going to work, but maybe medication does. So that's one of the next steps, of course, to uh, more systematically look at that. So can we improve? We can certainly do better, of course. Well, one thing is make it more playful. It's darn boring, as I'm sure. <laughs> Most of you are realize. Um, we've done some work in this area and especially aimed at adolescents who drink a lot or use tons of marijuana but are not really highly motivated to change. So we had a gamified version and it was basically failure because initially they thought they actually rated it higher. So they have higher expectations to think, oh, this is actually fun. After a couple of trials, you find out it's not a real game, it's just people trying to manipulate me. So <laughs> satisfaction went all the way down, really not good. And then we thought about it again. And um, what gamification primarily does is to improve the motivation to do this boring training, right? But that's not the same thing as wanting to change your behavior. That's a different variety of motivation. So I think this is good to do, but it doesn't mean you're there already then in terms of motivation to change. You should still work on the motivation to change. Could of course invent games to work on that, but maybe motivational interviewing is just a more simple and direct thing to do. Then we have a line of research working on the alternatives. Um, personalization is something which is kind of obvious next step. Um, if you only like beer, then all of the whiskey and wine pictures are not very relevant. But there's something more, I think, meaningful in the alternatives. And this came from a line of research with smoking, where 
our question was like, what would be the optimal non-smoking category? So the question is, what is not smoking? Yeah, we get back to philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> it can basically be anything, but it would also be a different thing for different people. So that's what we tried in the first proof of principle study. And then you can think both of goals. Why do you want to stop smoking? Well, maybe somebody still has a goal to run a marathon, so you can put in sports pictures and running, etc. Somebody has a partner who's a non-smoker, wants to live longer to see grandchildren. You know, it can be very different. So there I think it's really interesting to look also for other addictions, but surely for smoking where non-smoking doesn't exist, in personalized alternatives. And we're currently running a trial uh, directly comparing the standard non-smoking, just visually match people holding a pen with more meaningful things. And as a byproduct, I think a good thing from a therapeutic perspective here is that it links the CBM more to the CBT. Because in your session, you're going to find out why does somebody want to change. So you together find these meaningful categories and what could be alternative ways to reduce stress, for example. Well, if it's swimming for one person, then you put in swimming pictures as well. But the next person hates swimming, but likes gardening, etc. So I think this is really a promising way to go further. I already mentioned the big differences in the learning, probably related to more general neuropsychological functioning also. So the, clearly these need to be personalized. And then we have this uh, idea that maybe training could actually work better if you do it after reactivation. And this is related to research in PTSD, where you uh, see that if you reactivate the traumatic memories and then interfere with the reconsolidation, that it reduces vividness of memories. So there's some basic research looking, can we also do something like that? So first study in smoking showing interesting results and we have an online first study where we have very surprising results. I'll talk about it further on Monday. And then we have this line of research on neuro adding neurostimulation. So you can add RTMS, general TDCS, which is transcranial direct current stimulation. So you do a very light current, mostly over frontal cortices, and it increases working memory and reduces craving. And we have now a series of studies with uh, test NL where we add it to the CBM and see if the learning rate increases. The short answer is it does, but it doesn't really make a difference because they're pretty fast anyway. And there's all these varieties. But we do get a main effect on top of the CBM effect that again in the one year follow up, the people who had real TDCS versus placebo, because you also have a nice sham stimulation where you do a very short stimulation uh, and the computer does all this so it's double blind and the one thing you feel whether you get the real one or the sham is just when it's switched on you feel kind of tingling effect on your hair but that's in both conditions so everyone's sure they had the real condition uh, but we see it again a difference on the uh, long-term outcome so that could also be interesting to relate to uh, neuro rehabilitation He's in a collaboration with an old friend of mine who runs a lab in Barcelona, um, mostly related to re rehabilitation after stroke, but we think there's actually interesting commonalities, possibilities <coughs> with addiction also. So uh, if you're interested, we could also talk about that further. Here's a version where you have to uh, catch the non-alcohol and you save them there, as you see. All right, so in conclusion, um, <coughs> cognitive training can be of use in the treatment of addictions. Uh, I think it makes sense to differentiate between these general ability training. There is promise. It's definitely long. It's kind of challenging over the internet because I think you need a personal therapeutic relation here. But in inpatient recovery, it could still be a useful tool, I would argue. And there is CBM, which is effective as an add-on to addiction. It's not a big effect, but it's about as big as current medication add-ons. Say 10% less relapse in a year. And clearly there's room for improvement and further research, I think. <coughs>
that's always good. Um, I highlight some of my collaborators and that's the Lindau team with the nice clinic here in the background. Marilisa Boffo and Matt Field whom I did this reanalysis of the existing data with. And then there's ex-PhD student and current PhD students and postdoc and collaborations of course uh, with a lot of people. So this is clearly teamwork and uh, well as you mentioned uh, also with your nice clinic so uh, happy to be here and I'm sure there's <laughs> questions. <laughs>